All right. Welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice question series. We're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe for all of our updates. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard. Study hard. Let's get going. Skill acquisition plan says, if the learner does not respond to the first SD, you should use most to least prompting following the next SD. This applies to all skilled targets. What type of prompting would you use first if there were no other instructions? Pretty straightforward prompting question to begin. So we're looking at the type of prompting we're going to use, given these are our only instructions. And remember, we're only using the information given to us in the question. So ask ourselves, what do we know? Well, we know the plan says, if the learner does not respond to the first SD, then we're going to start prompting. And we're going to use most to least prompting. Now, most to least prompting involves going from an intrusive prompt to a less intrusive prompt to a less intrusive prompt. So if we consider that a hierarchy or a scale, the least intrusive prompt you can provide is no prompt. You just let the learner engage without a prompt. That would be the least amount of prompting. The most amount of prompting is what? And sometimes people get a little confused on this because we tend to think of full physical as the most intrusive prompt, but really above that is what we would consider errorless learning. Errorless learning is really the truest form of most prompting because with errorless learning, you're preventing all errors from happening. Whatever you have to do to prevent the mistake, you do it. The, the biggest form of prompt you can give. So if we're going to use most to least prompting, and we're just starting with most to least, with no other instructions, then we're going to have to start with A, errorless learning. Graduated guidance is the type of physical prompt where we use as much physical prompting as necessary, and then we fade it immediately. Full physical would come after errorless, but errorless is going to come first. Could you use full physical for errorless learning? Could. If that's what it takes to prevent mistakes. The best answer is still going to be errorless learning, even though you may use full physical in errorless learning. And then D, modeling. Modeling is a step below all of our physical prompts. So if we're going to use most to least prompting, and the only instructions we have are use most to least prompting, then we're going to start with errorless learning. Tyreek reads out loud, which helps him comprehend difficult passages better than when he reads to himself. When Tyreek does this in class, however, it distracts his classmates. His teacher is working on a plan to get Tyreek to start reading to himself more often while in class. What does the teacher need to make sure of with their plan? The question is asking about what? It's asking about the teacher and the plan. And what does the teacher need to be sure of? So what do we know about the plan? Well, we know Tyreek reads out loud and helps him comprehend difficult passages. But, of course, when he does this in class, it can distract his classmates. Remember, in ABA, we're looking to change behavior in, in a, an effective way, but also in a way that's going to be okay socially. It's great that Tyreek has learned a strategy which helps him comprehend passages better, but is it always the most socially valid strategy? In this case, no. So the teacher is going to, to use a plan or develop a plan to get Tyreek to start reading to himself more often while in class. So essentially, she's replacing reading out loud with reading to himself, which seems like a good idea. But what does she need to be sure of if she's going to continue with this plan? A, that Tyreek is happy about the plan when it is implemented. Do we consider the client when developing plans? Of course, we want to involve them as much as possible. Is the client always going to be happy about the plan? Absolutely not, especially when working with children and even adults. They're not always going to be happy about the plan. If we only designed our plan based on the happiness of the client, it would be very difficult to come up with anything truly effective because the, the easiest plan, the plan that's going to make them most happy, isn't always the most effective one. So she's not going to make sure he's happy about the plan because she wants to make sure the plan is effective. So B, that Tyreek's performance isn't impacted significantly by the plan. She needs to be really careful about this. Remember, when you decrease a behavior, 
or change a behavior, in this case, she's changing Tyreek reading out loud, you've got to remember that behavior is happening for a reason. In this case, it's helping Tyreek comprehend the passages better. So if the teacher's going to change that behavior and decrease that behavior, she's got to be sure she's not reducing Tyreek's ability to comprehend and perform. We have to be very smart about when we change behavior, that we're replacing it with something, or we're giving the learner a different way to accomplish the same goal. What about C, that Tyreek gets extra time to read if he is reading to help himself in class? Well, that's not really the point in, the, in what the teacher is trying to achieve here. We're not sure about the accommodations. It, it's not really relevant to her necessarily plan in this case because she's just trying to replace the behavior. So C doesn't, isn't really relevant to what the teacher needs to be make sure of with their plan. And then D, that Tyreek's peers are more supportive of Tyreek moving forward. Would it be great if the peers were on board? Absolutely. Can she try to get the peers on board? Maybe. Is this something she needs to make sure of? Again, no. The goal of the plan is to be effective. And in order to be effective and teach him this new behavior, she has to make sure that new behavior doesn't hurt Tyreek in the long run. Because if we get rid of something that's serving a purpose and we've replaced it with a different behavior that doesn't serve that same purpose, then we failed the client. Remember fair pair rule, right? You decrease something, you've got to increase something else, but you've got to increase something else that's meeting the same objective, that's accomplishing the same goal. So what does a teacher really need to make sure of what their plan will be? That Tyreek's performance isn't impacted significantly by the plan. Cindy Luhu is hanging up her Christmas tree. As Cindy hangs ornaments on the tree, her younger brother watches Cindy and starts to hang his own ornaments in the same way that Cindy hung her ornaments. Cindy is acting as a what? We're looking at Cindy here. Cindy relative to who? Well, her brother. So what do we know? We know she is hanging up her Christmas tree and she's hanging ornaments on the tree. And then her younger brother is watching her hang ornaments. So what does he do? He starts to imitate her. He's now hanging his own ornaments in the same way that Cindy hung her ornaments. So be careful here because we're looking at Cindy's behavior. Her brother is imitating. Cindy is not the imitator here. She is the model. Now, is Cindy a planned model or an unplanned model? Well, what's the difference? A planned model is contrived. It's similar to think about discrete trial teaching versus naturalistic teaching. With discrete trial teaching, is very contrived. Naturalistic, which is using incidents to teach. In this case, Cindy isn't necessarily meaning to act as a model. It's not like the information is saying Cindy set herself up as a model. All we know is, as Cindy hangs the ornaments, her brother watches her, and then he proceeds to hang his own ornaments. We don't mention anything about being contrived, about being planned. It just so happens she becomes a model for her brother. So in this case, Cindy is acting as a B, an unplanned model. It's the difference between a planned and contrived situation versus something that's naturally occurring. In this case, it's very natural the, that Cindy is hanging the ornaments in the tree, and her brother watches as she does it, and then he imitates what Cindy does. Your client is motivated by coins, so you bring a bag of nickels that your client can earn during DTT. The client keeps their coins in a pile next to them. If the client puts their head on the desk to escape work, the client loses a coin. What type of intervention involves losing the coin if you want to decrease head on desk behavior? Now, we obviously have a consequence intervention going on here, and if you're fluent, this should be a very straightforward question because it's very apparent what we're trying to do here. Well, let's break it down. So we have an intervention that involves losing the coin, trying to decrease that on desk behavior. Typically with consequences, we want to look at what happens to future behavior. We don't know what happened to future behavior here, so we just have to go by what is the intent. All right, so the intent here is to decrease behavior. So the consequences that decrease are extinction and punishment. We're looking for either punishment or extinction. Now, what else do we know? We know the client's motivated by coins, so you bring nickels. The client keeps those coins in a pile. If they engage in the behavior to escape work, you take the coin away. So you're removing the coin with the intent to punish. Now, what would that be called? A, negative reinforcement. Well, it would be negative, but it's not reinforcement. Reinforcement would involve a goal of increasing the behavior. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to decrease. So we're trying to use a punishment procedure. 
Well, B has punishment, but it also has positive. It's not a positive procedure because positive is adding something. Here we're taking it away, the negative procedure. So what we're doing here really is C, a response cost. Response cost is also looked at as a negative punishment procedure because you're taking away a reinforcer contingent on behavior in order to try to decrease that contingent behavior. So if you're taking away this coin to decrease head on desk behavior, what you're trying to do is use a C response cost procedure. Wallace is torn between two interventions. He's been using a comparative analysis for the last month and has a month's worth of data on each intervention. One intervention is based on reinforcement, while the other intervention is based on cognitive behavior therapy. If Wallace is a certified behavior analyst, what must Wallace consider when deciding between these two interventions? So what do we know and what do we ask? Well, the question is asking about Wallace. He is a certified behavior analyst and what he has to consider with these interventions because there is going to be times as you work as an analyst, or you've got more than one intervention to think about. And you've got to go through some checks and balances to make sure you're picking not necessarily always the best intervention, because the best intervention might not fit what you're trying to do. And why is that? Well, let's look at Wallace. He's, he's used this comparative analysis. He's got data on every intervention. It's great. One's a reinforcement based and the other is cognitive behavior therapy. So what does he have to consider? A, which intervention is conceptually systematic? B, this is where it gets important. Because if Wallace is delivering behavior analysis, he must remain conceptually systematic. If that cognitive behavior therapy intervention, even if it's better, isn't conceptually systematic, he is likely going to have to go with the other intervention, which is conceptually systematic. That's, that's one of the ways we evaluate interventions. So A seems true. What about B? What do the data say? Should Wallace evaluate his data for these interventions? Well, absolutely. He has a month's worth of data to look at. We make data-based decisions. We are data-driven. So he's taken a month worth of data on these interventions. He needs to use it. He needs to analyze that data. And then C, can he minimize risk to the client? It's always number one. Do no harm. Minimize risk. So if you have two interventions, maybe let's say one is a little more effective, but it's a bigger risk, you've got to do a cost-benefit analysis and say, I might use the intervention. Maybe it's not as effective, but it's a lot less risky. Maybe we start there, look at the data. Depending what the data show, if it's not effective, then we try the more risky intervention. But let's start with the low-risk, low-harm intervention. So if Wallace is a certified behavior analyst, he needs to consider all three. Which intervention is conceptually systematic? What do the data say about each intervention? And can he minimize risk to the client using one intervention over the other? Dr. Evil is trying to develop a laser beam that he can use to extort $1 million from the United States of America. Dr. Evil sends the president steps on how to send him the money as quick as possible. The steps represent Kind of a learning teaching question here. This doesn't come up too much because typically we think of rule govern versus contingency shaped, but there's also this idea of instructions. So how do we tell the difference between instructions and rules? Well, instructions, think of them as response prompts. They're just telling people or telling the learner or telling someone what to do. So if Dr. Evil was trying to get this $1 million from the United States of America, he sends the president a list of instructions or prompts on how to send him the money as quick as possible. A rule is a contingency, a verbal contingency. So if Dr. Evil said, if you don't send me $1 million, I will fire the laser, that's a rule. That's a verbal contingency. The instructions are the prompts for the president on how to send that money as quick as possible. And so that's just an easy way to think about instructions versus rules. And it's more or less common sense, but it can get a little dicey. Rules versus instructions, what's the difference? Just remember, instructions are basically prompts. They're basically response prompts. Rules are essentially verbal contingencies. If you do this, then this will happen. 
So try to remember it that way. Try to keep it as simple as possible. So kind of a different question, but more of an instructional learning teaching question. All right, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Make sure you like and subscribe for all of our updates. We're about to start exam number seven, so be sure to look on look be on the lookout for that. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you on the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.